I've been alone in the Mount Dandelion Hills for uh, a few days and you know I'd get uh, after a while uh, you, you're talking to yourself and so I'm not sure whether my thoughts are interesting or the ravings of a, of a demented hermit you know <laughs> but anyway I sat in the hills and thought about what I might say today um, and my dear hosts uh, they don't really know what I'm like or maybe they do know um, they asked me to run as wild as I like but not be too abstract which is quite a brief, actually. Um, run wild, but don't be abstract. So I think the solution I'll adopt is to tell you stories. So that'll keep our feet on the ground. And the idea is to open things up today so that other people can fill the spaces with more ideas that can evoke your enthusiasm and interest. But here's the question that they ask me to address. But because I've been in the mountains, I thought there's probably a more basic question first, which is this one, why learn am I? So I'll have a look at that, and then that kind of leads inevitably into another question, which is what is the it? So I thought I will talk a bit about that, and then turn to this question of how we learn am I? So to begin with, why? Why bother? It feels like, to me, like am I is an antidote to something, or it fulfills a need in us that lies a bit dormant in many settings. Uh, but what is the it that lies dormant? And I think it might be captured by this word, a guide. It gets lost somehow, this capacity, and we need to re-engage with it. That's my suspicion. And it's an age-old communication style that's been smothered by education, of all things, and the design and the delivery of, of care systems. So why is this important for us today in a conference on MI? I think it's because I suspect that MI is mostly about good guiding, plus a small modern refinement that I'm proud to have had something to do with. So I want to start by being clear about what guiding is. It's my main mission today. Um, I think it's that ability to trust the wisdom of someone to know what's best for them and to structure a supportive and purposeful activity, in the case of MI, a conversation, so that they work it out for themselves. Some people find it helpful to think about a, a driving instructor. Um, he or she does not actually do the learning, as we know, but is supportive and provides a framework or scaffolding for the person to learn the skill. Um, or an experienced tango dancer leading you as you learn by doing. There's another metaphor that might be useful. So we probably want to need and we need to learn MI because the guiding style that we all have within us is under continual threat for some reason. And I think this accounts for the interest in MI and justifies uh, its use and our struggles to learn MI. Um, now this simple little model that I developed with some nurses might help. These are three natural styles of communication. And it's easy to direct. Look around us. Everywhere. In all care settings. We have protocols, procedures, transactions, targets. So here's an exclamation from me from the top of Mount Dandidong. I did walk up. This is a pathological evasion of the one thing that's really appreciated by people, which is a guiding hand. And it's easy to rely on directing, and it's often dehumanizing. I don't know whether to laugh or cry here. And some of my experiences as a patient have reached beyond that kind of scenario. It's not, it's not that directing is unhelpful, or targets are unhelpful, or procedures are unhelpful. It can be really useful as a style. But why has it become a default across so many settings? That's the puzzle. I don't have the answer to it, but it seems like it's become a default. And I think the interest in MI can be accounted for by the simple fact that when it comes to promoting change in someone else, Directing is not very helpful. And that was the origin for motivational interviewing and continues to be the thread that runs through the work that we've been doing. 
We're trying to understand what is helpfulness. Now look, like, like guiding, I think directing is an age-old style. And it's within us. Um, you know that phrase, casting pearls before swine? You come, I just came across that recently. And then I looked it up and I discovered it's in the Bible. Yeah? Casting pearls before swine. Um, what is that? Is it, it's speaking to the frustration about feeling like you know what's best for other people if only they would listen, the swines, the pigs. Because they don't listen, they're called pigs. Uh, you see what I'm saying? It's been around for a while, that. I'm going to tell you a few stories about guiding that have inspired me. Um, you can see a, a guiding style in the behavior of mothers and parents. And it feels like they're born with it. And this is probably the fuel that drives learning and adaptation in infants. I'm not a developmental psychologist, but I'm a parent of four of them. So I've watched a thing or two. Um, it's a loving, guiding hand that promotes learning and change. Uh, there's a field of developmental psychology you might want to take a note of this concept. Um, it's really interesting stuff. Now, my understanding of it is, is superficial, but I, I, I urge you to have a look. Called maternal scaffolding. Have any of you heard of that? Yeah, maternal scaffolding. It's really interesting stuff. And the word guiding is used there in that field. And despite some cultural differences in parenting style across groups, in, in free play, uh, <coughs> mothers use the style and parents use the style, naturally. It, it, it's creating a supportive structure for the child to learn, and I think the word scaffolding means you only create as much as is needed for the kid to learn and you remove the scaffolding as you progress. And so that if I sit with my two-year-old with a puzzle, he's at exactly that age, I think you know what can happen if I'm under stress, irritated, um, not really engaged with his task, and he's doing a puzzle, I'm likely to tell him what to do. And you can see a parallel process there in other spheres of, of, of interaction and communication. Okay? And of course, what he'll do is he'll knock it down and run out the room. Okay? Or I might just let him get on with it, in which case he'll probably run out the room. And so guiding is that process of scaffolding it where you engage with a child and you give him just enough structure there to make him go, oh wow, I can put that on top of that. And I've been having these experiences a lot recently with him, so I do live and breathe this. Um, now, it, just in case we think that this is sort of loose hippie psychobabble from Mount Dandidong, um, I don't think it is. But um, consider this, when mothers are traumatized by war, abuse, deprivation, or deprivation, okay, so that's quite close to us all, they apparently lose this capacity to guide. And they either overuse directing, or as you can imagine, they just let the child get on with it. So they swing either side between directing or following, okay, and they lose the central capacity to guide the child. And what they've found in a couple of trials is that if mothers are taught to relearn the style, the behavioral and educational outcomes for the kids are better. So there's something there for us to get a hold of as to how we can improve the care that we give to clients and patients. How's about this for a story? Because I think it illustrates the link between MI and guiding. Um, I was out in Cape Town running a, a motivational interviewing workshop in a treatment center for children with HIV AIDS. Okay? And I was really nervous about this. I'm crossing cultures big time, even though I know one of the local languages, lots of different tribal groups, very different uh, backgrounds to me. And I'm heading in there, and these are not only people from a different culture, but most of the counselors and staff I'm training have got HIV AIDS themselves and are, are supporting their peers, right? And I get asked to come and run a, a workshop on MI, okay? And I do my best, 
Um, and I was relieved to get away, to be honest. I thought, Whoa, is that really going to impact practice? And um, because I'm a, a, like a bit of a drug pusher for the positive beadwork project called Kids Positive, which is run out of that ward, <coughs> every time I go to Cape Town, I visit them with an empty suitcase and take beadwork back. And I was on a mission like that to get the beadwork. And I'm walking down the corridor, and I see somebody whom I remember called Numfunela. And she came running up to me, and she threw her arms around me. And I thought, oh, what's up here? And when we parted, she's huge, right? So I disappeared into her arms, <laughs> right? And when we parted, I said, Numfunela, what's up? And she said, thank you. And I said, what for? And she said, she left the workshop on MI, and she realized that she'd been yelling and shouting at, at a child, at a little boy, and she decided to shift the way she was with a boy, and it's made the most amazing difference. So there you have a workshop on MI, actually probably about guiding, that rung true for her as a parent, and I think it validates what I'm talking about, the link between MI and guiding. And so that's a story from Numfunela. So in conclusion, um, learning MI is not learning something completely new. Which is one reason why my daughter gets it. I told the folk in the workshop this yesterday, but I know some of you weren't there, and I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. Uh, she was bored and she phoned, she contacted me on Skype from down the road where she's staying with a friend. And I thought, well, why are you contacting me on Skype if you're with a friend? And she said, well, I'm bored. So I said, you want to play a game? And she said, yeah. So I said, okay, um, tell me about your favorite place. And I will, what I say, the way I speak to you, I want you to speak to me when we reverse it. And I used one reflection after another, six or seven reflections. And then I said, okay, now it's your turn. Ask me about my favorite place. I told her, and she used six or seven reflections in a row. Now, how come she can do it? Okay. And I think this next picture should help. The top three elements are really about helpfulness, more or less a, a following style. And then there's evoke, and it's this evoke piece that is the purposeful side of motivational interviewing and gives rise to the refinement that I talked about. And, it, and what we saw there was the refinement. It was the use of open questions and reflexive listening to further evoke a deeper sense. You got that feeling of deeper change there, didn't you? Yeah? To evoke a deeper sense of of why and how change is worthwhile for her. And it's the thoughtful and curious attention to the language of change and helping someone to evoke more that is what the it of MI is. It's got a beguiling simplicity about it. Do you know what I mean? It was just a normal conversation. It's it's got that deceptively seductive, simple quality to it. Um, but it is difficult to do and it requires practice. But get to the point where Trudy is and it's easy. And I watched, met Trudy when she first came onto the project and in a matter of six, nine months, she's now the senior MI trainer within the project. And she moved that quickly. So there was something in her already that we recognized and thought, wow, this person's going to be really good, and she was. Stories, okay? Stories to lift the spirit. Um, how about this? I met a, psych a clinical psychologist a few years ago, and he told me the story which made my jaw drop. Okay. Um, the field was the treatment of children with diabetes. I tend to do a lot of work with children with AIDS, children with diabetes. And that was the field. And in every city, there is a specialist tertiary level clinic that deals with kids with type 1 diabetes. So it's a very serious condition. Okay. And he tells me that there's this clinic that he just moved on from, but he used to work there, that took a very different approach to usual practice. And I thought it'll be interesting to contrast 
that clinic with typical practice, which I'll call Clinic A, and you'll recognize. You'll all recognize this, okay? Um, clinic A is using what we might call an approach headlined by the flag in front of the service, which is next, please. Okay. And they process kids through this and that consultation with different members of the team because they're monitoring and managing. That's how they see their work, okay? Monitor and manage, okay? Not change promoters, okay? And they're crazy busy, okay? Their consultation times are short, and they've got a hell of a lot to do to do what they want to do, okay? And the kids spend a lot of time in the waiting room because things don't always work out well, waiting to be called, next, please, okay? You know this culture, don't you, okay? And it's rife. Forget about hospitals and tertiary care of kids, it's rife. Okay. Now let's have a look at what the psychologist described to me. Uh, their song was different. And it was expressed in the very first contact with the receptionist. And their song was, who would you like to see today? Okay. Who would you like to see today? And the kids chose. And sometimes they didn't feel like seeing the doctor. The team accepted this. Waiting times came down. And medical assessment occurred as a byproduct of this more, much more important goal, giving people what they wanted from the care system. Yeah. And of course, we, we can all be anxious, but hang on, who's, who's monitoring the HbA1c levels here, what's happening there? And of course the nurse would keep an eye on it if the, if the kid didn't want to see the doctor. Okay? Because there, if you work in a team, your roles are often interchangeable. Right? And here's the interesting thing, their target HbA1c levels were just as good as the national average. They weren't, they weren't better, but they were no different to the national average when you looked at the targets. Okay? But targets wasn't the focus of their work. And the psychologist reckoned that the staff were a lot less stressed about time and more engaged with the patients. So learning MI would be easy there. Do you get it? Dead easy. Yeah? They're ripe for it. They're ready for it. And I think in that, that ward that I went to in Cape Town, they were also actually. They were also ready for it. Hence the story about Numfunela. So MI will thrive where there's a, a community of practice that's got a different set of cultural values running through it. Okay. And the idea is really is to fit systems around people, not people into systems. To fit systems around people, not people into systems. And that's a big shift for many of us and I think probably the most important one of all. Shall I tell you a little bit about family nurse partnership? I think, it, I think it's of interest because it does exist in Australia. Kate Billingham, yeah, does it? Yeah, in the remote um, Aboriginal community. In the, that's where they've started. Yeah, in uh, Northern Territory, Family Queensland and Northern WA. That was my impression. Northern WA, Darwin area, Kakadu, all that, and, and Northern uh, Queensland as well. That was my impression in Aboriginal communities. That's the work of Kate Billingham, whom I've just quoted, who's going around the world trying to help people deliver this program with fidelity, because it's, it's quite a delicate, beautiful piece of fruit, and the idea is to kind of get this replicated around the world. Okay? Now, it, this involves intensive work with first-time teen mothers, as I've said, okay, in deprived setting. In the British context, not, not, not here in necessarily in your Aboriginal communities, it's what we call clinically sticky carpet land. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah? You walk into the house and it's dirty and the carpets are sticky and your feet literally stick to the carpet as you walk in. And it's a metaphor for like an environment that you know has got D for deprivation written all over it, right? Um, boyfriends in the yard smoking dope, drinking, carrying on, television really loud, an Alsatian dog sitting there right in the lounge with you and dog shit around the place. You know, that's the tough environment, right? 
And many of the clients, the young mums, have got a history of being in care or are homeless even. Okay? Now, this has got a brilliant leader, which is an important thing, okay? called David Olds. And the senior people like Kate are also likewise very tuned into the parallel processes I talked about. And it involves home visiting nurses who go in and establish a relationship with these kids, and they do it until the kids, uh, the babies too. Okay? That's the idea. Okay? And the, the idea is to break the cycle of disadvantage, and it can be done. I've seen it. Okay? And Kate describes it as the intensive care end of prevention. It's actually about prevention, but it's very intensive care. Okay? And what astonished me was that MI sits at the center of this, which I didn't know anything about the program until it got launched by Blair's government uh, in 2007. And I got asked to go to London and meet this guy who runs it, which is David Olds. And um, I said to him, could we each ask each other one question that was really important to us? Because we only had 20 minutes together. And m his question to me was interesting. He says, how can I help nurses avoid telling mothers what to do. So in the context of this talk, you can see. Yeah? That was his big challenge. My question to him was, why on earth are you interested in MI? And his answer was, was, was really quite interesting. It's, he said, I don't see MI as the solution. I see MI as a powerful ingredient and the fuel that drives good practice. And it's good practice that we're after. From that moment, I was wedded to this program and have, have been involved in, in starting the training of the first tranche of nurses from the outside as an expert. Um, now they're all internal and they employ their own MI trainers in the organization and there are over a thousand nurses and it's growing in Scotland and, and, and all over the place. Now they all sing the same songs uh, in this project right from the top about a guiding style. So a lot of the stuff I've been talking to has been internalized into the culture. Okay. Uh, the dangers of the writing reflex, they love the phrase writing reflex. They haven't hit the rapid engagement phrase because I haven't taken it in there yet. I've just developed that here on this trip. Um, I think they'll love it. You know, how do you rapidly engage with someone? Um, I'm hoping they do. Um, they've got a phrase of their own, which I think is very beautiful, which is, we work with their heart's desires. Now fancy that as an approach to a kid whose child is at risk for going on, on uh, being taken into care. And they turn around and say, we work with the mother's heart's desires. You can see how tremendously emotionally intelligent and mature is that response. Okay? And the nurses all sing that song. And they tackle very tough changes like drug use, smoking, um, all sorts of behavioral, difficult behavioral problems. They raise in the context of working with the heart's desires of the, of the young mothers. So it's not just about being nice and friendly, as you've seen. It's, they're dealing with tough topics. <coughs> and this is all on the foundation of, of, what, of trying to work out what will make the young mums more robust and connected with their kids. Okay, and I bet you that's what you will see if you go up to Kakadu area, um, I hope. And I know we've got a couple of very good MI trainers in Queensland who who are working on this as we speak. Um, their annual study days are a sight to behold. That's where you pick up the culture, okay? And I always get invited. I'm a bit of an old grandfather. And this year, <coughs> I got asked to give the closing address. And I showed this Trudy's video, okay, which was great. It was, everybody was applauding, and we all loved Trudy. Um, and then David Old sent a video greeting from his ranch somewhere. I don't know where it is, uh, somewhere in, in America. Um, and then something happened that I thought was really stunning. Two young mothers came up and sang a song in honor of their nurses. Okay. And it was a beautiful song. And then someone brought their kids up onto the stage. Okay. And 900 people stood and applauded. Now, what does that say about a culture? Yeah. And all it took was inspiration from somebody like David Olds, going right back to the beginning, and I know the story now, and gathering a few people around him and saying, well, let's just try and do this differently. And, you know, you work in a small team, okay, um, and my, my, my advice to you, unsolicited, 
would be to try and create that culture within that team and go for it because the people's lives are at stake and it's worthwhile. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wind up very soon and in conclusion, what I want to say is every consultation and every conversation counts. The first ones are the most important and the first 10 seconds of the first one is the most important. That's where you can really make a difference and start engaging. And that's about an absence of clutter. And so my hope is that we can all commit to this idea of helping colleagues shift their focus and use their skills not to solve problems for people, but to support them to make decisions for themselves. And so today is going to be interesting, I think, and I hope it's going to be fun, and I bet you that theme's going to run through it. Um, I thought I'd end, because I was worried about the brief about not being too abstract, I thought, oh my God, I better be super concrete, right? So I thought, okay, well, what are my five top tips for learning MI, right? So uh, I felt I had to do this, right? Um, um, please don't quote me, right? I just made them up on Mount Dandidong, all right? <laughs> they, got, they got no other, other relevance. It's Mount Dandidong ravings, right? God, what a beautiful place. One of the most beautiful places on this earth. Um, but I hope they're helpful, and here they are. Okay. The best way to learn MI is to start by unlearning. Clearing your mind of clutter and tuning back into what a good guide does. Forget about clever strategies and other ideas you might have. Slow down the pace. Slow it right down and your progress will be much faster. Okay. Be bold and be brave and be humble. It's a curious mixture. Make mistakes as you learn and even in front of colleagues or your supervisor. And when you're with clients or patients, entertain the notion that they have the answers inside them. Your task is to guide them to face in a direction that seems healthy and can lead to their fulfillment. And when you do this, often by using just simple open questions, it's not all that complicated, their language about change will emerge. It'll emerge naturally and notice it and reflect it, summarize it, affirm it. And you'll make excellent progress and your outcomes will be better. <coughs> so these ideas are not cast in stone, let alone produced in a paper or a book. Uh, but I'm sure as today unfolds, I'm hoping they will serve as some kind of conceptual and clinical anchor for understanding the, the wonderful contributions that I think are about to follow. And I think at that point I'll stop and say thank you very much.